Okay, here's our welcome. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for showing up in this uh, weather. But I have to say the rain is good. You can't, you can't be upset with rain. It's like kind of, it's always a gift. Um, but I'd like to introduce Brent from Intrinsic Nursery down in Hebron, about 12, 14 miles away in Illinois. Brent's the coolest, one of the coolest growers I know because it's not just the growing of plants, it's kind of the understanding of who the plants are and then taking them and combining genetics and crossing them and creating something with garden value, not a fashion plant to sell at Home Depot, but garden value so when it goes in the earth, it has the genetic knowledge how to live here. So that's the main value and he's come up with some really beautiful plants that have very, they lend a really artistic sense to gardening. Well, you can find many, many ways to combine them for their, their uh, use. So Brent, take, take it away. Thanks Thank for being you, here. Happy to be here and support your 30 years. Um, I was here about 30 years ago or maybe 31 years ago. Snooping around, I heard there was a new perennial grower in, in, in the area and I was just starting my business in 1991 after I graduated from uh, Oregon State in ornamental horticulture. And so I started growing perennials. I heard Roy or someone was up here growing perennials. I came and looked around at the fields. So I didn't find anyone. But uh, about five years later, I met Roy in the garden at the garden center. Just said hi, basically. <laughs> Maybe another year or two went by and said hi and we talked. So I've got a lot of maybe <clears throat> little antidotes and stories about Roy, but I will kind of work those into my talk. We'll go into more of the plant meat and bones first, and then we'll touch on some of the Roy-isms that I, that I love and you love. So one of the things Roy has done for me is uh, share uh, people like Pete Udolph, friend of his, and you can pass that around. That's an older picture, maybe 2010 or 2012 when Pete was in town to visit. Um, and then books, uh, Jewels of the Plains is a book that Roy recommended and I love. Um, and then this is the book that got me started on this path. Um, introducing and, and finding and raising new plants. So that's, that's one of the mentors I never got to meet. Um, Alan Bloom. After reading that, I decided that's what I want to do. Um, Allium Summer Beauty, we all know it, and we know it because of Roy. Uh, Big Beauty is a kind of um, take on Summer Beauty. It has a similar flower color, a uh, similar bloom time. The, the main difference in the garden is it's a little bigger, so the flower cluster is bigger, the size of the stem is bigger, the foliage is wider and on the gray green side as opposed to the deep green, glossy green side. They make a nice kind of combination in together. Roy has used it. Uh, Pete, I do believe, used it at Detroit Garden. Um, and, and it has uh, kind of that same look, but in a maybe larger, and uh, maybe less uh, showy in foliage um, altogether compared to Summer Beauty. The beauty of Summer Beauty is that deep green from April to October. This is a little more subtle. Uh, Butalua gracilis honeycomb. So there's a plant from the Southwest of the U.S. called Blonde Ambition, and it has a yellow flower, but it's native in the Southwest. And it doesn't really thrive or survive well in the Midwest. So this was my answer to that. Um, so I bred 
with blonde ambition and a, and a Midwest ecotype or Midwest source of a Butalua gracilis. And the result is this more adaptable, hardier, um, similar in size and texture and, and kind of presence in the garden um, to, to Blonde Ambition. But this one is maybe not quite as showy because it doesn't have the, the blonde flower, but it survives in the garden and uh, you can use it in the Midwest where we live and grow. Yeah. What kind of conditions are best for? So Butalua gracilis is going to be native in dry to rocky soils, open ground. So it's never going to love that uh, plant encroaching or next to its crown. So that is part of the, the habitat of the plant. So that's what it's going to want in a garden situation. Um, Echinacea purpurea show-off might not look too special to most people. It looks like a regular purpurea coneflower. But what it was selected for was this more orange cone and then um, the reflexed petal, which is typical of purpurea in nature. But through the years, um, what I do in this case, it's grown from seed, so it's called a strain. And the strains are, in a sense, reborn and re-improved um, every year. So every year I take the best echinacea show-off, and in my eyes, the best, has orange cones, a wide petal. Now they're encroaching three quarters of an inch wide, and long and reflexed. Good vigor, good size. It's not short. It's a three to four footer in the garden, depending on site and um, exposure and age. Um, but I do love that process of kind of, it's almost like an evolution. So each year it changes and hopefully it gets better. So I did bring a few plants um, that uh, are not on my, I didn't bring to sell. This is one of them. Uh, it's an Eryngium yuccafolium prairie moon. And if you compare it to the species, the species grows four to five feet tall, typically in rich soil or many garden situations, it's flopping, falling down, even in the prairie it will do that, where it has a lot of competition and the, the soil is gonna be leaner less nutrients probably. Um, this is more or less an, a Missouri ecotype. Um, so it is grown from seed and we um, only grow yucca folium prairie moon. So there's no kind of cross pollinating uh, likely. Um, the difference is prairie moon is three feet kind of average size. It's thinner, bluer foliage. And it's one of my favorite plants not patented. You can grow it from seed. Um, what else? Seed head. I mean the bud is ornamental. The flower is ornamental. The seed head is ornamental. Tough plant. Drought. Super drought tolerant. Never seen it wilt. If anything it needs sharp or dry soil. Average to dry soil. Um, it uh, would not like a wet situation. Um, Eupatorium perfoliatum is a native wetland plant. And about 10 years ago, I found one with purple foliage in Fontana in the fen. And I took seed, I grew the seed out and I picked one and named it Milk and Cookies. Roy can never remember the name. so. Milk and cookies has been cookies and cream, cookie jar, cookie this, cookie that. But it doesn't matter, I know what he's talking about. This one is an improved form. After many years, I finally got one that was better than milk and cookies. It's called Blind Date, because I don't know who the other parent is. I'm pretty sure 
It is maculatum because it does have a hint of pink to it, which the species doesn't have pink. Um, it is a creamy, milky white flower. It also has hybrid vigor. So in, in the ground, in the wild, uh, perfoliatum, Eupatorium perfoliatum gets typically about three feet tall. It would grow right in water. But um, blind date, when it's happy, rich soil, it will get four to five feet tall. And this is one of many of my plants you can see at the Chicago Botanic Garden in the Lavin Garden. Um, that's the trial garden at the Chicago Botanic Garden, and this one is out there um, as a two-year plant. So um, right now it was bordering three to four, maybe four plus in Lavin, and um, it's just starting to bud. Um, we also do have a hybrid that's really impressive. Um, it's a hybrid with perfoliatum. Um, with the red purple foliage and something else, who knows. But the something else has thinner, glossy foliage. And that one's called polished brass because it comes out kind of brassy or um, polished because of that glossy foliage. Polished brass has that same creamy white flower from five feet tall all the way down to the ground. It's like a shrub and it's tons of flowers and tons of pollinators, great pollinator plant. Um, can take it average to wet soil. And uh, when Fergus Garrett was in town with Jill touring around, he came to Lavin and he said, what's that? I wanna go see that plant. <laughs> that was polished brass. So we have out there in retail land, some other plants that uh, may, did not make the stage yet. Um, so one is called Hasta Astaminiana. Hasta Astaminiana is virtually a cross or a combination of traits of Hasta Francie with a thin green edge and green leaf and gold standard, which has the gold center and the green edge. So Astaminiana has a gold centered leaf pretty quickly in uh, late spring, thin white edge, and sometimes you'll get some green in that edge as well. Um, good vigor, uh, tough plant, can take a lot of sun as well. Um, Liatris Trailblazer is a Liatris Spicata selection I made for uh, purple stem, and that purple stem bleeds into the buds, into the flowers and uh, gives you not only um, a little more color to the flower and the stem, but as the uh, flowers fade from purple, they, the seed head is near black. So it's like a deep purple to black uh, seed head that is um, very showy in the garden, especially with light colored plants and um, background, great with grasses, uh, three to four foot grasses. Uh, Ligularia Treasure Island is a new one for Intrinsic this year. This is after many, many years of evaluating and watching um, some hybrids uh, that occurred naturally. This one is a cross with Dentata so it has kind of typical dentata foliage. In the garden, <clears throat> foliage will be kind of average six to eight inches wide. Has that nice rhubarb red stem all the way to the top of the flower. Um, <clears throat> kind of uh, two stages of green, the, the lighter green and the darker green, which is a nice kind of combination in itself. Then you put that on top of the rhubarb red stem and uh, you got some more attributes compared to maybe a, a straight dentata. The flower and color and cluster kind of comes from the other parent, um, potentially palmata loba. And so um, it's not that typical dentata flower that um, it's a almost like a 
a cluster trying to be a spike. Um, but this is gonna want rich, moist soil, ideally some shade. Um, but good hybrid vigor. And uh, my dad, when he used to plant ligularias in the garden, he would take a half bag of peat moss, sink it into the ground, put the ligularias in there, and they would be super happy. He had a customer in Glenview with 75 you know, six to seven foot spikes on Liggy Larry the Rocket and customer couldn't be happier. Yeah, it could be partly pH. I mean, peat moss is gonna be on the acidic side so I would try working in some peat moss next time you do try a ligularia. Um, I think it's worth the try and maybe not a half a bag, but um, that, that should help. Um, you know, this, I don't believe there was irrigation in this garden. There was a fountain nearby. So it was probably constant moisture in nature. I do believe they grow along streams so they're, you know, cool sites, lightly shaded and partly shaded, moist, constant moist is probably ideal. Uh, Millennia Dutch Dreamer. I didn't even see that on the truck. Anyway, Millennia Dutch Dreamer is a uh, selection. Um, I wanted something kind of intermediate between the three and four footers that are common in the trade and then the seven and eight footers that are available as well. Um, so I selected Dutch Dreamer. At the time it was more five to six. Um, I've seen it at six, but a lot of times um, it depends on site. So it can vary between five and six. Um, it has a really nice yellow fall color, upright habit, quite upright. Not quite a north wind upright, but um, upright, nonetheless. Uh, Minarda Bradburyana Midnight Oil. Um, we do have some here at retail. And um, it ha it's a, a selection I made um, based on um, propagation and production problems I was having. What's typical in the trade in Minarda Bradburyana is a mix. So you have green ones, you have chocolatey red ones, some in-betweens. You have glossy leaved green ones. You have um, hairy leaved ones. Um, they pretty much all have the light pink flower with the nice wine colored spots, June blooming, no mildew. But the variability of the, the, the um, forms in the trade are quite variable. So some are weak growers, some peter out in propagation or production, or even in the garden, they just don't have vigor. So I selected one based on clean foliage and propagation, good vigor, um, beautiful, glossy, deep green olive, uh, mature growth, but new growth is a chocolatey red on a, on a glossy leaf. Um, and when you put it all together, it makes it a lot easier to grow. <laughs> uh, Panicum Prairie Dog is one that uh, Roy was trying from New Moon this year, and then he found out it was from me. <laughs> uh, so Prairie Dog was selected for its short stature, four to five feet tall, depends on site. Rich soil, it'll probably be five. Lean, dry, uh, rocky soil, it will probably be closer to four. Real nice um, blue-green foliage, um, close in color to maybe Dallas Blues, and um, I would call it an improved prairie sky. So prairie sky had, for me in production, had a lot of leaf foliar issues, 
Um, it would get thrip damage that would show up as kind of browning tips and or uh, stripes on the leaf. Um, so I, I never wanted to grow um, that one because it just never looked great for me. In production where I'm overhead irrigating twice a day, every day, um, it didn't work for me. But uh, Prairie Dog is not a dog. It, uh, it's got great um, clean, that was kind of the, besides the shortness of the plant, the clean silvered foliage was a big um, part of why I selected it and introduced the plant. Um, there's a lot out there. Almost every panicum in the right spot and in the right climate, like Florida, will get um, rust. Um, I did just hear from one of my propagators and growers in the East Coast that Prairie Dog is the cleanest or one of the cleanest for them. Um, the older the plant gets and the more it's in the trade, the more kind of you're propagating it in poor conditions, the more chance of that. But I'm, I'm hopeful it's going to stand the test of time. Pocahontas. Um, is one of those plants I actually bred. A lot of times the bees made it or it's grown from seed or I had open pollinated seed and I picked out the best ones. But in this case I took a short pink called Pink Dawn, my first introduction in 96. I bred that with a selection of Huskers Red, which has a white flower, but the red foliage. Took that seedling and crossed it back to the Penstemon Digitalis selection. And the result is a vigorous, taller, pinker Penstemon Pocahontas. So, so the two-step process in that case. Um, Roy did use this at the Arch Garden in um, the museum in the city. And here we have the namesake of the day, soft rain. Pulmonium soft rain. I've been breeding and selecting and watching and growing Pulmonium reptins almost from the beginning, 30 years almost. And this one is one of my favorites. The color is on a blue sky day, pretty close to a blue sky. So a little lighter blue compared to the species. It's uh, finer and more compact compared to the species. Um, not fertile, so you can grow it from seed, but it wouldn't be necessarily uniform or the same color. Um, in the garden, it will get bigger, but in the pots, they're right around a foot tall. In the garden I have at the nursery, um, it's about 15 to 18 inches, but I, it's definitely finer leaved than the species. And I love the color. It's kind of a, a blend of colors. The, the, the bud is deeper than the petal, and that combination is really nice. Uh, Rebecca American Gold Rush, um, we have at retail. It is a 2020 award winner for AAS All American Selections. It's kind of a dome shaped, almost like a mum shape. Uh, so it grows about two feet tall, um, up to three feet wide. It has a lot of disease resistance. It's easy to propagate, it's easy to grow, it's easy easy to garden with. Um, and it's a little softer color than um, Goldstrom, which is more on the gold side. This is a little more to the yellow gold side. Um, so if you like that habit, um, it's a July bloomer into August, September, into October. It's a long bloom period. Um, it's probably one of my best plants. It's gonna be grown worldwide now. We have a Israeli company, Danzinger, 
taking it to five other worldwide markets, including Europe, China, Japan. Um, so that's exciting. Um, sweet as honey. This is my favorite Rudbeckia because it's yellow. It's not gold. Um, it's, I love kind of things that grow in rocky, dry soil, hence the sedum and the sedum book. But uh, this is almost like a miniature form of Missouriensis Rudbeckia, which grows in the Ozarks in gravelly soil, dry situations. Um, this has extra thin and hairy um, texture to the foliage, which keeps disease um, at bay or from, from invading the plant. There's a, a fungus called septoria, which basically will kill Rudbeckia goldstrom in the, in the um, garden if it's present. But these are very resistant. American Gold Rush, glitters like gold, sweet as honey, and a fourth one coming with uh, yellow cones. Um, but I love the size of it. I love the color presentation. Each stem is like a little bouquet, seven plus or minus flowers. I have a, a nice little mix of sedums. I won't talk about every single one, um, but these are more or less the ground cover types. Um, we have a variegated one called Cutting Edge. We have kind of a chartreuse green to yellow, depending on site. One called Yellowstone. Um, kind of an improvement on Dragon's Blood and Full de Glute called Rock Candy. Rock Candy is bred or a parent. One of its parents is John Creech, which makes a great ground cover, weed suppressing. Um, nice pink uh, rose colored flower to go with it. And then Sedum Nerds. Sedum Nerds has a kind of reddish russet winter color, evergreen, white flower in June, kind of finishing now, but good ground cover uh, in between steps and pavers and um, <clears throat> around rocks. A um, couple other nice medium statured sedums. Peace and Joy is kind of a uh, magenta pink, dark pink form of thundercloud and darker pink um, compared to Rockstar. But those are all uh, about one foot tall in the garden. And they all have this kind of grayed green foliage. This one even has purple in the stem and the, the edge of a leaf. And then we have uh, Lime Joy. Lime Joy was selected for its vigor. It's a little bigger, about 15 inches tall, and kind of looks like Annabelle Hydrangea or Sedum Autumn Joy in bud. Um, it's that kind of limey color, um, July into August in bud, and I think it's worth growing just for that um, kind of presentation. And then it does get magenta in the flower, um, flower head. I do have a couple of stackies. So comparing to the other stackies in the trade, like Humalo, which was bred by Ernst Pagels in Germany. Um, this is a little more to the pink side. Um, it also has a little larger uh, flower head or floret. So more petals and a little showier in the garden because of it. Uh, also a little taller than Humalo, comparatively. And then uh, Summer Crush, this one's called Summer Romance. Summer Crush is what I like to call white with pink, uh, compared to pink cotton candy, which is pink. This is kind of white and pink and has more vigor Larger size in the garden, 24 to 30 inches tall in the garden. But I, I think they would be nice all together. Maybe one day someone, maybe Austin, could make a uh, Stackies River somewhere. Or I will. Um, then we have Verona Castrum, Virginicum Queen of Diamonds. And this was strictly um, 
selected for selfish reasons. Um, much of the time when we're overhead irrigating for for Anacastrum, they get spotted foliage and we can't sell them. I love the plant, so I started breeding, selecting. Um, this one we can overhead irrigate and it still looks good, doesn't get spotted. And in the garden, it will never be spotted. Um, light pink flower, nice bronzy new growth, four foot tall, upright in the garden. Um, this is another one I brought and I love, but it's not on my original plant list, um, Solidago. Uh, it's a hybrid called Sugar Kisses. Um, so one parent is an upland, dry loving Solidago that used to be called Aster tarmacoides, became Solidago alba. Now it's something else, who knows? But that parent um, that grows in dry, rocky soil, has a white flower, typically 15, 18 inches tall. I bred that with a wetland species with thin foliage, gold flower. And the result is this, it's a white petal, creamy yellow center, and it does make a nice cut. Uh, Roy actually loves the plant in bud. I like it now in bud and in flower. Um, it's a great kind of limey, bright um, green in bud. And I'm hoping uh, some cut flower growers uh, will pick it up. It's got a strong woody stem. When you put those stems in water, they last a week plus and they're gonna start to develop roots right away. <laughs> so vigorous. Um, it's one of my favorite new plants. It's new this year. Um, and then Roy was gonna put some combinations together with these plants. <laughs> See that? I don't know. It's a That's too good. <laughs> I mean, I love what I enjoy the most is the sensitivity to the differentiation you have to see to see and then combine the plants and have the patience to wait in our culture. We don't have patience to wait for anything, nothing. Can you speed up anything Can you, except aging? We all want to live and be young and look young and keep doing young things. And, but every time I go there, he shows me a new plant. And every time I look at the new plant, I look at what are the possibilities. And I think that's what, what it's all about. It's not having something new, like our culture wants new this and new that, but it's using plants that have garden value and using old plants in new ways. So I brought a few old plants up, and I don't say it that loud in front of them because they're actually new. These are little children. They're only a year old. But a plant not used too much, it's a native Coriopsis, Coriopsis palmata. And Coriopsis palmata is very durable, so it has durability. It, it spreads some people would say aggressively, but when it hits something, if you have a crown of a, uh, like a prairie drop seed, a crown of a dense grass, it can't go through it, it can't overwhelm it, and the grass usually will be about the same height as a Coriopsis, so they, they become friendly. So you don't have any over overwhelming characteristics about it. Um, so I thought, well, I'll show it, and the Coriopsis has kind of a golden yellow flower. And it's, it's got a nice, kind of a tough texture to it, too. Just when you rub your hand on it, you feel like this is a tough plant. Because it has a kind of a, I'll have to pass through. And I think I'm just, I, I'm used to doing that because when I was doing, plant, I do plant production, you touch everything. You touch the roots, the crown, you hold the seeds in your hands. So I'm really used to fondling, you know, plants in different ways. So when I look at what, Brent brought with them, like the taller stakies, is what you'd have to look at is growth rate and growth habit. If you put these two in the ground as young plants in the one gallon, who's going to outcompete the other? If I use a one-to-one -one ratio, this plant wins. This plant's going to spread, send rhizomes out, it's going to shade this plant out. 
But if I look at the height, it'd be kind of pink, with the kind of pinkish white with the, for me with the gold. And I'm not a colorist or anything. I know I don't claim to be an artist and understand color that much. So I'm usually just satisfying myself about what I know. I'm not trying to satisfy others as much because I, I, just, I just like the height and this vertical and this gets moundy. So I would probably take one, two, three, four, maybe five or six of those. I put one of these over here. Then I take another five, then I put one here and one just like a small island and use four or five or six of these compared to one of those because of the nature of its spreading habit. And as it gets wider and puffs out, the cool thing they'll do, when, it, when, it, when they meet, then you'll have the combined texture of the foliage meeting the stem and the pink of the butt. So it's, that, it's, it's when they blend together, that's when you have your Monet moment, when you have the softening of edges. And that's when you look at something like this will be leaning and it'll blend into this bloom here. And then, then you have to see is the golden yellow and the pink and white. How do you feel about that emotionally, that color combination? And I know I'd like it because I, because I would like it. I don't know, I can't explain. And someone might say, geez, Roy, can you get these things out of here quickly? They, could, they just couldn't handle the gold. They couldn't handle the pink with the gold. So you never really know. And sometimes that, I think about that when I, after I do a combination of plants, I go home and sometimes I can't fall asleep thinking, they say, are they going to like what I just did? Because it's kind of a rough, it might be a rough ride at first when they see it. So I, and I, then I try not to think about it. It, it just, it's, it's what it is. Okay. Then another plant I just started growing about two years ago. There's a calamiris, this is calamiris integrifolia, it's called Daisy May. And I've known it was in the trade for years. I just thought, why would I want a white daisy? I've never been a white daisy fan. I see them in the fields, you see. And I have to say, I've never been a Shasta daisy fan because they die quickly. They flop on top of things. So I've never really used daisy. But when I got Daisy May, and the way, it, the, way that the flowers are kind of gently scattered through the plants, it's a bad plan for me. And again, it's myself dealing with me. I'm not, I'm not dealing with other people's judgment. I'm dealing with my own judgment. But then I kind of like the looseness of the white. And I like the fact that it's flowered for a long time. So with that gentle look, the gentle flowery look. So I'm thinking, where oh, if I take these two, you know, I run to Echinacea. Again, it's it's spotting them in. Hey, chicken. And you kind of put this with this. This is roughly a little taller, and the Echinacea, the, the larger heads of the pink would be floating through groups of white. And the idea is, where do I stop it? What do I start next with it? And that really relates to the scale of the garden, how big the garden's going to be. But I think that's really a kind of a cool look, and it's a simple look. But it has that it has that feeling of fantasy. It has a, a little fantasy look to it. And and if you think about it, if I took this combination with the pink, and I drifted prairie drop seed through here as a river of soft textured arching grass, I could use this and this together and just tie together the grout would be the grass drifting through it. So I could have two simple combinations. Then I could take the prairie drop seed and run it out here. <coughs> oh, Rebecca, yeah. this is this is a shorter, right? Sure, it's a shorter, and it's a plant that loves, prefers dry soil. So prairie drop seed grows in very modestly dry soil, but it tolerates wet too, so it's a more forgiving nature. But then I could take the drop seed, maybe moving this way, and I could just take prairie drop seed, running through here. Here's my river with these two patterns. Run the drop seed through here. Let the drop seed collectively be alone, because that's a rest moment for the eye. And then pick up the drop seed and simply put that in between it. They keep the whole planting simple. 
and just run the drop seat through here and kind of have it tail off. And maybe space-wise, that's all space I have. But these three groupings would be a nice, simple combination. And you could back it up back here. You could go into some taller things like take the take the auditorium and the Verona Castrum and simply put them with some of the Panicum Prairie Dog. So you got the Eupatorium, which will form a big colony, a nice big group with purple foliage and this flat, beautiful white. It's like this cloud settled on top of a purple golf tee or something. It's so purple. And you have this cloud of white. You have some Panicum with the blue foliage drifting through it. And then right as the Panicum ends, you put in the beautiful Veronica cash that has the spikes. So you're contrasting the white, flat, white with the vertical pink spikes. And Panicum Prairie Dog, that's your matrix, that's your grout, holding it together because it's, it's very vertical. And I haven't grown Prairie Dog yet in the earth, so I'm not sure exactly how tall it would actually be in this area. But that's so then I'd use this as my backdrop, the drop seed with the simple Rebecca with the soft yellow flowers would be simple. This grouping with the white, the sprawlers coming through it. And, geez, you got a guard. <laughs> and then as it establishes, you just edit it the way you want. Maybe I brought blue Provskia over, maybe use some blue Provskia. I, have, I brought that over, little spire. And I like this Aster Twilight because it, it doesn't have much disease issues and has very kind of sky blue flowers. And I might put four or five little spire and drift this through the little spire with these beautiful white blue, flo blue flowers going through the ghost gray foliage of the little spire. So then huh, I just add it to my garden. So, so there's no, it's, it's the cool part is no matter how you approach it, because this is you being you, creating your signature. It's that time when you get to wherever you're at with it, where you start to feel unstoppable. You just all of a sudden, you gotta have someone, hey, it's time to eat. Hey, it's time to, because you just like the things you're creating, and the things you're creating have a sense of, of uh, a connection with each other. You're creating a community. And then your community becomes modestly easy to maintain as long as you show up every couple of weeks with a Dutch push pole and weed between it till about mid June. Mid June, the earth is covered. The light can't hit the soil. So you don't have that much to do except gardening. It's you, you take labor out of the equation and you become a gardener from mid June, July, or just, well, I'm, and you can even move plants in the summer. You just cut them back and you make sure you're around to water and nurture and care for them in July and August. So the gardening, it, it, it doesn't have to stop. And sometimes when I look in the United States, most people stop gardening around mid-June. You know, the benches are empty at the garden centers. No one wants to get rid of everything. So we become a nation of whatever else we do. So, yeah, that's a quick few combinations. Yeah, when I go to Brent's nursery, it's like visiting, you know, when you're a kid and you go to Sears store at the toys before Christmas. <laughs> okay, wow, look at all the cool stuff. They used to go to Sears and everything was there. The hockey games. And so when I go to his nursery, I go, geez, look what, like this. That Eryngium. This is too good. That's a damn nice plant. There's the other one is the flowers on the species, they're about almost three to four feet above the foliage, which is kind of cool too. You know, you, it's not that that's bad, but boy, this really is a cool plant. And the things you could do with this, again, with prairie drop seed or cesslaria, mixing some echinaceas behind there and different heights and maybe some white echinaceas. And that's why when people go, geez, Gardening, that's just a lot of work. All you do is see, is, no, that's not all you do. I, I, there's no, because it's a personal thing, but what, what art form is more challenging than gardening? 
There's no, because you got all the dynamics of time and weather. You got constant change. If you're, if you're an interior decorator, you're not worried about the table getting twice its size in the next two weeks. The curtains aren't going <laughs> to, the curtains aren't going to grow and go down the stairs and you're, you're, there's nothing going to change. It's not going to rain inside. You're not going to get flooded out. You're not going to have construction equipment riding over your wood floors. It's, it, this is, I think one of the most challenging art forms is the art of gardening. So, if you have any other things to add to that, right? Yeah, I mean, you did a really nice, um, simple planting in Fontana by the public um, restroom and the playground. Oh, yeah. You did American Gold Rush tucked in with the Shamsia Gold Tau and a few other plants, maybe some hydrangeas. Yeah, really nice, simple combo that I, I love and I take a lot of pictures over there. Yeah, it's right, it's a simple three plants, but it's how they, they kind of complement each other nicely. Yeah, Roy did a lot of gardens in Fontana. If you haven't seen them, you should see them. Um, I got to see this driving home from dinner one night and it was a good opportunity. You're an artist, yeah. for sure. It was a nice There's no doubt about it. That's, uh, that's our presentation. <laughs> so thanks for hanging out here. And uh,